Hello and welcome back. I'm Ricardo aka the Manhattan and this is a series on how color theory can help us creatively use light and color. As we dive deeper into the technical side of color, I would highly recommend you check the previous videos in the series to get up to speed. Also, if you don't want to miss future episodes, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. Last time we looked at what color is and how it affects our subconscious. Today, we're learning how to identify different colors by their properties. The first thing we need to understand is how to identify a specific color. Throughout history, many different methods were developed to differentiate between different shades, tones, tonalities. But today we're going to focus on one of the mains that we use in color grading, which is HSL. The acronym stands for Hue Saturation Luma. Three properties of color that when combined allow us to identify one specific pigment. Hue is what we define as color in our everyday life. So for example, red or blue or magenta. Hue on its own is a relative concept, as technically is the degree of difference between two colors. If you imagine taking all the colors and putting them into a circle, effectively looking at the difference in hue means looking at the degrees of difference between them. In everyday life, we still do that in a way when you say, you know, this red is more orangey or slightly more pinkish. That's what we're referring to. Hue allows us to be more technical in how we describe color. Saturation refers to the intensity of a color. In other words, how far or close is it to being gray? Finally, luma refers to the brightness of the color compared to pure white. If you think about how we describe these three properties, if you combine them, you can put hue on a circle and then saturation and luma are linear. So you get two more spatial directions. Effectively, what you can do is put them together to build a cylinder that contains all possible shades of color. Now that we understand how to define color, it is time to look at how it is formed. As we already said, an object can either emit or reflect light. Something that we didn't talk about already is the fact that color by itself exists only in a ray. What I mean by that is that, as we defined it the first time, color is a sensation. It exists for a brief moment when light hits the cone receptors in our eyes. The light by itself contains all the different colors, so light effectively is a spectrum of wavelength. When the light enters our eye, different wavelengths activate different cones. Those cones produce an electrical signal that combined with the others forms an information that our brain decodes as a specific color. And if we go back to what we discussed last time, these three cones decode essentially red, blue and green. So as the light enters our eye, the color we perceive is just a combination of red, green and blue. These three colors are the primaries for an emittive light model, which is usually referred to as an RGB model. And the definition of primary is simply a color that cannot be formed by mixing any others, so it exists on its own. It is important now to notice that light does not only contain three frequencies, it's just that our eye is built this way and thus we coded everything in relation to that. A good and common example of an RGB model is an LED monitor. If we took a magnification of that monitor, what we'll see is that every pixel is actually made by three, or well, sometimes four, LEDs. I'm seeing three or four because it can either be just a red, a green and a blue LEDs or it, they can also have a white LED that serves as a luminosity compensation. The monitor creates different shades of color by simply changing the luminosity of the individual red, green and blue LEDs. With this example in mind, it is fairly easy to understand that the more saturation we want in a color, the brighter we'll get in an RGB model. This is why we refer to an RGB model as an additive type of model, which means that as we add, we get more saturation, we get more color. If we now think at any reflective object, and by reflective I mean that simply does not emit light on its own, what happens is that light hits that object, the object absorbs part of the light and then reflects back what it could not absorb. The light that gets reflected is effectively deprived of part of its original wavelength. As a result, if the object absorbs red, it emits cyan. If it absorbs green, it emits magenta. And if it absorbs blue, it emits yellow. And if you've ever worked with a printer, you probably know where I'm going with this. The primary colors 
for a reflective model are cyan, magenta and yellow, which effectively means that a reflective model is a subtractive model, or in other words, a model where we get more color by subtracting one of the primaries for the emitting model. Again, a good example is a printer, which works by mixing magenta, yellow and cyan. You also probably experienced this when you were painting as a kid. The more you added colors together, the darker the paint will get, no matter what you did, unless introduced back white. One interesting thing to look at now is the fact that while the film is based on a subtractive model, digital cameras are based on an additive one. Parking that for now, as that is for another video, let's now look at what secondary and tertiary colors are. When we take two primary colors of a model and we mix them together, we get a secondary color. Effectively, the secondary colors of the RGB model are cyan, magenta and yellow, and vice versa. Tertiary colors are obtained by mixing a primary color with an acquaintance secondary. So, for example, mixing red with yellow and you get orange. With all this information established, we are finally ready to discuss one of the most interesting and probably misunderstood concepts in color theory, color harmony. For that though, you'll need to wait till next episode. So, you know, make sure to hit the notification bell. Thank you for watching, I'll see you soon.